Hey there, welcome to How To Videos with Dr. Amy Gates and welcome back if you've been following along with our introduction to statistics. This is one in uh, several of a massively open online textbook that I'm creating in video format for the introduction to statistics. You can also find information at mathandstatistics.com. This particular video talks about frequency tables and histograms and we'll use Excel for examples. So a frequency overall can be considered the number of times something happens in a data set or how often an event occurs. That's what the word frequency means, frequency or how often or how many. And so in your classes you might be asked to do something like create a frequency table. You might also be asked for something like the relative frequency or the cumulative frequency. And then finally, you can use uh, a graph such as a histogram to describe that type of frequency. And so let's see how that works by looking at a couple of examples. In this first example, we're going to build a frequency table. We're also going to include the relative frequency as well as the cumulative frequency. And we're going to do this for a data set of letter grades. So in this case, we're looking at a data set that has discrete data. In other words, we have letter grades A, B, and C, but there are no grades between A or B, or B or C, so it's discrete. It's qualitative. These letter grades are describing a category or a class or a quality. They are not numerical in nature anymore. Even though we associate them in our mind with num number values, these letter grades themselves are not, in fact, numerical. And finally, this data is called ordinal. That's its level of measurement because the letter grade A does have a greater value than the letter grade B and, and so on. They do have an order to them. So when you're creating a frequency table for discrete data, your job is a little bit easier because the classes or the categories in the frequency table are already defined for you uh, as part of the data set. So our first category will be the letter grade of A, our second category B, third category C. We have a category for D and a category for F. So we have five different categories in this frequency table and the label is going to be the grade because that's what this data represents as a set of grades. Now the first thing we're going to put in our frequency table is the actual frequency. The actual frequency is the exact number of times that each of these letter grades occurs in the data set itself. And so it's color coded here so that you can see it much more quickly. The letter grade A, for example, is coded in red and you can see that we have six A's in this data set. And so the actual frequency of A's here is six. Same thing with the letter B. Letter B is coded in blue. And if you look in the actual data set itself, we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten Bs in this actual data set. So we've got six A's with us here in this data set, ten Bs, we've got seven C's, three D's, and two F grades. Now, as you know, this data set is just a sample. It's not all the grades in the entire universe, it's just a single sample of grades, possibly from one instructor's course. And this is the actual frequency of A through F grades in that particular course. The next thing we have here in the frequency table is called the relative frequency. To get the relative frequency, what we're asking for here is how many A's, for example, are in our data set compared to all the other letter grades. In other words, relative to the whole data set, What's the percentage of A's people have gotten? In order to answer that question, I need to know how many letter grades are in this data set. I need to know the size of the data set. So the size of this particular data set is 28. There are 28 letter grades in this data set. And so to figure out the relative frequency, I divide the number of A's I have by the total number of grades. So I've got six A's out of 28 grades, if I do that division, I actually get a decimal value of 0.2143, which I've converted here to its equivalent percentage. So about 21.43% of these grades are an A. So a little over 21% of the people in this class got an A. And then I did the same thing for all the other letter grades. I know I have 10 Bs, 
And so out of all 28 grades, I know 10 of them were Bs. If I do that division and I convert the resulting decimal to a percentage, I get that about 35.71% of the people got a B. Seven people out of 28 got a C, so that's about 25%. Three people out of 28 got a D, that's about 10.71%, and two people out of 28 people got an F. We know that because we're looking at every single possibility in this data set that when we add up all these percentages, it has to add to 100% because we did all 28 people. So the relative frequency is the percentage of this class or category relative to the data set itself. This data set had 28 values, six of them were A's, and so the relative frequency for the letter grade of A was a, a little over 21%. The cumulative frequency adds up the relative frequencies until we finally get to including everybody. So this is just the A's, so those two values are the same. But the second cumulative, or accumulating all the values, is when we have the A's and we add them on to the B's. So the A's and B's together, if you accumulate them together, are actually a little over 57% of the grades. And you can see that here, that if 21 and change people got an A, 21%, and over 35% got a B, then we know that over 57% of the class either got an A or a B. If we continue down here and we add on the C grades, so here's our A's, our B's, and our C's, if we accumulate these together, add them together, that gives us 82.14% of the class. This actually tells us that over 80% of the class passed. That's another good piece of information. Finally, we'll add on the D grades in the fourth column down here. That gives us 92.86% of the class. And then when we add on the F grades, we get everybody. So the cumulative frequency literally accumulates each of the extra percentages until it gets to 100%. So this is a frequency table that has also relative frequency and cumulative frequency for a discrete and qualitative data set. Now what if we wanted to do something like this, but we wanted to do it for data that was not discrete and that was not qualitative. So let's take another example. In this example, we're actually going to create a frequency table for continuous data. You'll notice that our data here, which actually represents the heights of male and female college students, this data is definitely numerical data. It's the height in inches, and it's continuous, and you can see that I've left all the decimal places here along with the values, so you can see that there's an infinite possible number of heights people can be. Definitely continuous and numerical. This is quantitative, and it's ratio data because it can have a true zero. So when you're creating a frequency table for continuous data, you don't have the easy part of already knowing your different classes or your different labels. What you have to do is decide what you want those labels or classes to be and how many classes you want. Let me show you the end first and then we'll come back and see how we did that. I decided in this case, and it was completely arbitrary, I decided I wanted six different groupings. I wanted class one or grouping one to be anybody between the height of 50 to 52 and a half inches. And I wanted the second group of people to be anybody between 52 and a half and 55 inches. And so on and so forth. Once I create ranges or groups or classes, then I can count the absolute frequency of people in that range. So when you deal with continuous data, you have to first create your classes or your ranges, then you can essentially and very similarly calculate your absolute relative and cumulative frequency in very much the same way that we just did. So let's go back and see how that works. In this particular case, I first want to know what's the range of the data that I have here. 
Well, I know that my very smallest height value in this particular data set is 50 or above. I know that my data range is no smaller than 50 and no greater than 65. So I have to know this about my data set. If you don't have this information, all you need to do is figure out the min of your data and the max of your data. And if you wish to be on the safe side, you can use a slightly smaller value than the min and a slightly bigger value than the max. It's up to you and it depends on your application. Here the smallest is 50 and the largest is 65. So this is the range of all the possible data values I can have in here. The next thing that you want to determine, and you can notice the capital U here, is you get to choose the number of classes or bins or categories that you want. Again, let's see what that looks like again. Here I chose six different categories to figure out how many people are in each group. I could have chosen four, I could have chosen ten. It's completely up to you and it's arbitrary. It depends on how many you want for your purposes. Suppose in this case I want to choose six categories. So I want to separate my data set into six different ranges. I need to know the size of those ranges. And to do that, it's very straightforward. I take the range of my own data set. My data set ranges from 50 to 65, so the range can be calculated by taking the max minus the min of my own data set and dividing by the number of classes or categories that I want. Again, this is a number you come up with. You want 10 categories, you'd have a 10 here. Well, the range of my data comes out to 15. I wanted six different classes or categories, so I divide by six to discover that the width or the range of each individual class or category is going to be 2.5. That is why over here I start from my smallest value and I add on 2.5 to get 52.5 as my first range. Then I start at 52.5 and I add 2.5 again to get my second range. I start here again and add 2.5 to get my third range. So basically these classes are all separated by 2.5 because that's the width of each of these classes. So anyone who's between 50 and 52 and a half inches is in this group. Anyone who's between 52 and a half and 55 inches is in this group. Anyone who's between 55 and 57 and a half inches is in this group. And so on and so forth until I get to my very last group. Now you might wonder, what if somebody is exactly 52 and a half inches? Which group do I put them into? And that's up to you, how you want to manage whether your range is inclusive or whether you wanted to put a little like 0001 here so that it always goes in the lower value. That's up to you. The way I deal with that is I keep my values, I keep many, many decimal places. So it's very unusual that it'll be this exact, but not impossible. So you can decide which of your two classes you would like to place that in. So how do I discover now the absolute frequency? Once I know the number of classes or categories that are in my frequency table, and once I know their ranges, the absolute frequency is determined by counting up the number of people who are in this range and putting that number here, then counting up the number of people who are in this range and so on and so forth. And this is color coded, so let's have a look. The number of people between 50 and 52 and a half inches. Here's somebody just under 52 and a half inches, so they're going in that first group. Here's someone also under 52 and a half inches. Here's somebody between 50 and 52 and a half. And here's somebody between 50 and 52 and a half. So one, two, three, and four. All of them are in red, so I have four people in my data set that are in this range. Same thing with the next range. I have two people, I've got them highlighted in blue, that are somewhere between 52 and a half and 55. Here's one of them, here's the other. So I've got two of those. And so on and so forth. You go through and you can keep a count of how many people fit into each one of these categories or ranges. That's your absolute frequency. Just like in the other example, to get the relative frequency, in other words, 
percentage-wise, how many people in my group are in this height range? Percentage-wise, how many people in my group are at this height range? And so on. I need to know the exact number of people in my group or in my data set. Well, I've got 21 people in this data set. Four of them are in this range. So four out of 21 people are between 50 and 52 and a half inches tall. That's about 19.1%. Two of my people are between 52 and a half and 55 inches tall. So two divided by my entire group of 21, that's about nine and a half percent of my people. Three of my people out of the group of 21 are in this range. They're between 55 and 57 and a half inches tall. That's about 14.3 percent of my group and so on and so forth. As always, if you add up all your relative frequencies, they'll come pretty close or should be exactly 100%. Why would they not be exact? Why is it possible to get like 99.998% .998 here or something? The answer to that is you're rounding. Whenever you round and you don't keep every single decimal place, when you sum things up, you might be missing some decimals. But when you add these up, they'll come pretty darn close to 100%, if not exactly. The cumulative frequency is the same way. I start with class one, then I add on the second class, then I add on the third class, add on the fourth class, and so on. And once I add all the groups together, they will add to 100%. So in this example, we saw how to calculate or create a frequency table for discrete qualitative data for which the categories are already apparent. And then we saw an example of how to create a frequency table for continuous and quantitative data for which you have to create your own categories. Remember, the number of classes or categories is completely up to you. You could have had four, you could have had seven. So what can we do next with this? Once we have information categorized, we can build all kinds of fun graphs and charts showing that information using programs like Excel. This is an example of a histogram showing the categorization. Here's 19% of our people are in this group. 14% uh, of our people are in this group. Interestingly, this is not bell-shaped, even though height is normally distributed in most cases. This is not a bell-shaped curve. So it's got a little bit of a bimodal thing going on. It's got a little bit of a skew thing here. And so what's nice about histograms is you can look at the shape of a distribution. So this ends our first example. If you want to learn more about how to use Excel to create histograms and other charts, just check out my next how-to video on that topic. Thanks for joining me.